size for now. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's of course dependent on that if anyone has problems, it's but that's right. It was right. a way to turn for actually for receivers to tell that they wouldn't get video, but yeah, that's fair. I think, um, if people do want to have video on further presentations, that's that's fine. I will be running the slides during this time though. Okay. Um, yeah, at least if you have the client, you have a sh on the view, you have show participant video. I think it might actually to the checkbox under that menu. So you can actually. Mm -hmm. We're going to wait a couple more minutes before getting officially started just to let some people trickle in. Um, we have about 30 people on the call right now. Um, Leave uh Ian, are you here yet? On the list. So wait a couple minutes. Um in the meantime, I did add the uh Etherpad link to the WebEx chat. Um uh, please go and um add your name there during this session. Um that is the replacement for the blue sheet. Doesn't seem to be visible in the chat. Yeah, I was also going to say that. You don't see it in the the WebEx chat. Nope. Try reposting it. I'll repost it right here. Uh, that worked. While we are waiting to start, um, we will need a note taker in the etherpad. Does anyone want to volunteer to help out with that? Hi, Tommy, it's Tal. Um, I can take notes, but uh, usually etherpad uh, requires uh, good connectivity and uh, I prefer to do it offline. I mean, not on etherpad. That that is fine with me. Um, would you be able to copy them into the Etherpad once you have them sure. copied? That'd be great. Sure. Yep. Thank you. So for now, we can just use the Etherpad for our um, blue sheet. Um, apologies there. All right, let's get started. Um, welcome all to IPPM. Um, this is our virtual meeting to um, 
take the place for IETF 107. Um, I am Tommy Polly, and I am um, one of your ongoing co-chairs. Uh, we also have Ian Sweat as one of the new co-chairs, and Bill and Brian are out. And can I get confirmation that you guys can hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. All right. Um, this is the note. Well, you should be familiar with it, but if you aren't, please do take some time to look at this. This covers the um, guidelines for participation in the ITF and the disclosures that you can make. Since this is a virtual meeting and I think uh, virtual interims are a bit of a new thing for this group. I just wanted to cover how we're going to run the meeting. So if you are here, you are on the WebEx, so you don't really need that link. Um, we do have a Jabber room. For the blue sheets, we are using the Etherpad, which is what we've been doing for ITF 107 in general. Um, if you have not yet, please do go to the Etherpad and add your name and affiliation there. For the, um, if you want to have a comment at the mic effectively, we are going to be using the WebEx chat. That's the chat in WebEx, not in the Jabber room. And if you would like to join the queue to have a comment, please type Q plus and send that to everyone. If you'd like to leave the queue, type Q minus. And the chairs will be monitoring that. All right, so here's our agenda. We are first covering, as usual, our working group documents. Um, we have a couple status updates from the chairs. We have um, changing in chairing as well as our area directors. We're going to go through our working group documents from Al, Greg, and Frank. And then we have um, various other work that has received discussion on the list or we've talked about in previous meetings and so the last half hour will be spent covering those topics all right so for chairing um we do have ch a change in chairs and so i'd like to give a big thank you to both brian and bill um who will be leaving us as ippm chairs for all of the time and effort that they've put into this group um i think they've both in um, chairing since 2012 and have done a great job there. I think I was looking, we've had 18 RFCs published in that time. So just wanna um, thank them so much for that. And, and thank you all for being a great working group. And I will be continuing as chair and um, Ian Sweat uh, will be joining us. Ian, are you on the call yet? Um, we also do have a change in um, area directors. Martin Duke is our um, responsible area director going forward. Martin, do you want to um, introduce yourself a bit? Hi, I'm Martin. Um, happy to be here. Uh, spent a, a fair amount of the past week just kind of catching myself up on a lot of the, the issues in this working group. I'm excited to uh, work with you. Okay, on the document, I, we have several different updates. Um, Stamp was published as a RFC 8762, and we have um, the metric registry, as well as the initial registry contents in the RFC editor queue, along with the multi-point multi altmark document in the RFC editor queue. So we're making good progress. The uh, main IOAM core document, the IOAM data draft, has gone through working group last call, and we have received an update based on that. We will be getting an updated um, presentation on that today 
And I would specifically like to ask those who gave last call feedback to respond either during this meeting or um, on the list afterwards to indicate that the uh, feedback that they had had is addressed or not based on the current updates. And then lastly, um, the capacity metric method document and direct export for IOAM have been um, adopted and we do have the working group drafts of those uploaded. All right. So with that, I think we're going to start with our first talk from Al. Al, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, Tommy, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you great. All right. All right, great. Thanks. You want and, to advance slides. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, let, let me let me also add a thanks to uh, Miria, who has uh, worked with us for four years, uh, getting our drafts through as AD advisor. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And and so the the this this draft is on uh, the metrics for and, and methods for IP capacity measurement. Um, we adopted it as Tommy said. We've updated it also as Tommy said. And and Al and Rudiger and Len are are, uh, are the co-authors. Uh, next slide, please. So two slides on quick overview. Um, you can imagine a measurement that's uh, going to take a certain amount of time, a fixed time here, uh, interval length i, and uh, we're, uh, we're we're making measurements uh, very frequently and uh, using those measurements to uh, uh, operate a search algorithm. And uh, we're grouping the measurements in uh, time intervals uh, dt in length. Uh, we take the uh, number of bits measured in those intervals and, uh, uh, and then look for the interval with the maximum number of bits. That's the, uh, that's the measurement, IP layer capacity. Uh, and of course, we've uh, defined that at the IP layer. Next slide. So um, here's some more detail about the uh, the metric and the uh, the equation. Um, you know, there's there's lots of uh, metrics that could be defined, but we're focusing on the maximum, as that's the one that's uh, sort of easiest to pin down. And um, uh, just a couple of changes. We changed how we work the indexes a little bit here, uh, uh, so that the uh, n starts at one, and um, uh, and, and that, that's now consistent across uh, all the different definitions and the different standards bodies for this. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here's our status. Uh, we've had uh, many, many comments and, and reviews. Um, it's, I, I think we're getting very close to a, com a complete draft, uh, including uh, new reviews from, um, you know, talking about this with Etsy STQ Mobile, that's a, a technical committee. And uh, uh, we've got uh, new members of ITUT Study Group 12, uh, all the testing companies that you've used uh, in apps on your mobile phone, for example. And um, we've had uh, testing from various volunteers. All this has been uh, a good input and, and fed back into the document. So the key updates uh, in 01 are the measurement considerations and the reporting formats. Uh, next slide, please. So now we get to the meat of this, and, and uh, here's where I expect to get some uh, discussion going, hint, hint. So um, we have uh, uh, in section 8.3 on, on measurement considerations, it's not a new section, just the uh, new material, uh, where we're, we're covering the cases where, where packet losses uh, may occur independently from the, the sending rate. Um, we, you know, we sort of expected that, uh, you know, you imagine that loss will occur certainly uh, when you're at the capacity limit, but if there's some sort of uh, background loss occurring, uh, then these are the kinds of uh, uh, places where uh, we might encounter that. Uh, the congestion at an interconnection backbone, uh, that may be, appears uh, losses uh, distributed over time. Uh, a random early detection, if that's being applied someplace, uh, that could also be a cause. Um, but uh, a key observation that we've made is that uh, uh, when when we see these background losses, there's typically only a small degree of delay variation, and um, we we kind of expect that when we're when we're actually hitting the congestion uh, point, that uh, there there's going to be delay variation and uh, and loss. 
Uh, although uh, delay variation, the way we've left this uh, is that delay variation in the extreme is enough to uh, uh, indicate congestion. So, um, it also, if there's persistent competing traffic on the measurement paths, uh, similar to the kind of thing that we measured when we were uh, doing our Hackfest uh, measurements, um, then uh, that can cause uh, random packet losses in the test stream. And uh, uh, let's see here. It, all the uh, <laughs> all the uh, um, all the what is it? All the all the but oh, wrong one. All the uh, all the buttons for um, WebEx are in 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 my way of reading the the bottom slide there. But um, it's possible to mitigate these conditions. Um, but the first uh, first thing you should do is to try to uh, locate the measurement points as close as possible to the you know to the links that you're testing, and and try that first. So um, uh, next slide. Hello. <laughs> yep, I've. I think I've moved to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, okay, good, good. Thank, thank you, Tommy. All right, uh, and, and I should also mention, you know, I've, I've had pretty good performance today, but occasionally I get, I get cut off. So, um, you know, if, if, that, if that happens, it, it'll take about a minute, just, uh, uh, you know, wait for me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the, uh, we, we have this, um, we have this a search algorithm. It's uh, uh, described at a high level in, in section 8.1. Uh, we're now referencing the version that uh, uh, ITUT Study Group 12 uh, constructed as well. And, and, and basically at a high level, here's how it works. I mean, we start out with uh, status feedback reports uh, coming from the receiver uh, every 50 milliseconds is what, what the, uh, uh, you know, the prototype code uses. And uh, when we uh, test, when we look at the measurements and we see uh, that the sequence or, or loss or, or order errors are, are zero and the delay variation is less than a threshold, um, when we say yes to that, then we generally increase the sending rate. And we have the ability to increase that at a fast or a slow rate, depending upon whether we're close to the congestion point or not. Um, when, we've, uh, when, when we've got some um, ambiguity about whether there's a possible indication of congestion, uh, then we sort of put off the decision and we maintain the sending rate. So that's the uh, that's the orange path uh, diagonally through the middle. And then when we've got a definite indication of congestion, uh, where we've seen uh, you know errors, uh, losses, uh, delay variation above the the uh, upper threshold, uh, then we uh, reduce the sending rate and we have the ability to do that uh, uh, fast or slow. Now. Um, uh, one one of the one of the ways that we can uh, mitigate the case where packet losses occur independently uh, from the sending rate is to adjust the parameters of the search algorithm, and um, so I, I'm I'm illustrating that a little bit here too, where we can just by adjusting the parameters we can take away the slow increase, always make that uh, fast, and we can uh, take away the fast uh, reduced sending rate. Uh, and I've uh, marked those off by uh, stars there. So that's the uh, uh, that's the way that um, you know in general how how that would work. Um, I, and I know this this is really high level, but it's uh, you know the level at which we probably want to explain it here today. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So another point that's been uh, discussed uh, you know all throughout last year and and uh, this year too is uh, this turbo mode uh, concept, which uh, turned up in uh, uh, Matt Mathis's testing. He reported it on the uh, uh, mailing list. And um, we, at that time, we decided that we would, we would report the uh, separate results uh, for the repeatable modes. And um, you can sort of see that stylized uh, indicated here, where the first few seconds of a, uh, of a new flow uh, experiences a higher capacity and uh, then uh, the, the subsequent seconds, the sort of the sustained uh, capacity would be at a, at a lower level. The, um, I mean, th there, there's a rationale for this that uh, you know, comes from you know, loading web pages quickly or, or uh, buffering up uh, 
or increasing the um, uh, buffers in, in streams as, as fast as possible. Those are all key metrics. Um, but uh, other modes may be encountered. Uh, the question really is, and the tell is uh, whether they are, are similar to this, is are they repeatable modes? And um, uh, so uh, things like uh, radio constellation changes uh, when you're testing, uh, cell the cellular modes, use of those uh, as you're testing, uh, weather events, things of those natures uh, that they uh, they are either repeatable or or they're or they're not in in time compared to uh, you know the, the conditions that we set up for uh, starting and, and uh, finishing a test and so those you know those may be the simple conditions that we uh, we have to characterize as they are instead of uh, in in separate uh, reporting the results uh, separately but um, obviously any additional information uh, that you can gather about a test is uh, is useful to um, uh, to include. So next slide, please, Tommy. Okay. So um, we've uh, we've identified some reporting format elements uh, which we think uh, ought to be included here, and and that's the uh, uh, that the singleton IP capacity results. Uh, should be accompanied by the context under which they were measured. Um, it's good to get the timestamps for each of the uh, sub-intervals, the, the each of the DTN, especially the one where the maximum takes place. Um, obviously, the source and destination IPs uh, or other IDs, um, and the other inner, what we're calling inner parameters, uh, which are all the typical uh, metric parameters. So we've got a list of those in, in section four. Um, outer parameters. Uh, or, or measurement context, uh, such as uh, uh, performed in motion. You know, this is, that might be uh, the kind of thing you write down when it's uh, drive testing, or other factors belonging to the context. Uh, the result validity. Sometimes we know that uh, you know the test uh, terminated early because uh, connectivity was lost. Uh, things like that. So those are good to include. Uh, a field where unusual circumstances uh, uh, could be documented and also uh, a field to ignore or to mask out uh, results uh, in the uh, uh, aggregate processing once you, um, uh, once you understand uh, what's taken place in each case. Uh, okay, next slide. So here's the um, high level standard status. I, I, I said I was gonna put a slide in on this and I did. Um, in study group 12, we've uh, approved uh, the updated version of recommendation Y1540, what we often just call 1540. Um, and annexes A and B contain the, the new metric uh, method of measurement. And most importantly, the, the sort of the best uh, search algorithm is in annex B. Uh, there's also considerable background there where we've reported summaries of our test results. Uh, research uh, uh, on, on various academic literature. Uh, Rudiger Geib provided that, and uh, that's uh, distributed uh, in appendices 10 through 13. Um, Etsy STQ has also approved the metric in their uh, TS 103.222 part two document. And the, the approved links will take you right to uh, a place where you can get the latest versions of these, uh, just to mention that. Uh, the Etsy documents on, on high-speed internet KPIs. Uh, it, it makes a strong reference to Y1540 uh, for all the other material beyond the metric definition. Um, in the broadband forum, uh, the project to prepare this uh, metric and uh, method of measurement uh, has been approved. And we've got uh, a, a really good uh, review going there uh, for the last, um, really, the uh, project was approved back in September. And uh, we expect sort of a first ballot in uh, in May this year, uh, and so uh, making good progress with uh, this uh, a version of it called Working Text 471. And um, and of course we uh, we we know what we're uh, what our status here is in the IPPM. Uh, the Internet uh, Draft is adopted, and we're uh, uh, trying to make it better. So but we've got a, a a good harmonization process going across the industry. Uh, pretty rare, but uh, I think in this particular case where there's lots of ad hoc testing going out on in our uh, world, uh, that this is uh, this is valuable. 
Next slide. So next steps. Um, in the post working group adoption, uh, we have, um, you know, the harmonization activity, trying to keep up with the parallel efforts and ensure IPPM's expertise is incorporated uh, elsewhere. Uh, we're basically doing that through uh, flesh and blood uh, liaisons. Uh, Rudiger, uh, Len, and myself uh, are all working, you know, in as many places as we can to uh, uh, keep things synchronized and up to date. But we're not trying to uh, uh, do some formal synchronization where there's a, you know, a big bang and four standards get delivered. We'll, we'll sort of do it and, and uh, do the best schedule we can everywhere um, uh, and do the uh, uh, round robin updates if we have to. Uh, uh, we, we'd like to reach consensus soon here in, in IPPM uh, so that we can start work on protocol support. That's, I think, that's one of the real roles of um, uh, the IPPM in this uh, overall tapestry of, uh, of uh, metric uh, development and harmonization. So um, we'd like to get some additional volunteers for review, and if necessary, uh, <laughs> trigger uh, more reviews uh, with a working group last call. And I think, other than the references, I think that's my last slide, Tony. Yep, sounds good. Um... So if anyone has any questions or comments, please um, send a plus Q to the uh, WebEx chat. Um, otherwise, I would like to solicit um, if anyone does want to volunteer to review or has already read this, um, if you could please speak up. <clears throat> um, I think, yeah, we can definitely get this in the queue for Doing last call, <clears throat> um, specifically with the intention of getting more comments and more reviews on this. Very good, thanks. All right, thank you. Seeing no one jump up, I think we can move on. Thank you, Alf. You're welcome, thanks everybody. Right. So next we have the um, stamp option LV. Here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Um, great. Um, so uh, Greg Mirsky here. I'm presenting on behalf of offers of this draft, and um, as uh, you know, um, you heard that we have published the base specification uh, RFC 8762, and thanks uh, everyone uh, who helped us to move and uh, reach this uh, goal. But uh, this is an extension to this work. So next slide, please. Um, this is an update and. Um, to capture what been changed uh, between their, uh, our discussions is that uh, we define the stamp session identifier, uh, introduce uh, HMAC TLV for their um, identity protection, and uh, based on the comments we received at the last meeting in Singapore, so we clarify their uh, stamp uh, processing and um, location TLV, um, so it was uh, one octet uh, for destination port, so we matched it with a header size of two octets for destination port and uh, source port fields. And follow-up TLV, uh, we proposed a new name for this field uh, as a follow-up time step, so to uh, make it more distinct and differentiate from uh, timestamp, which is a field in a stamp base pack. Next slide, please. Uh, stamp session identifier. Uh, with the um, extension uh, to control their DSCP marking on the packets, uh, 
And the idea is that uh, DCP marking within a stamp session can change. So there, there is a question of what's a better uh, way to identify the stamp session? And well, it was not part of the thinking when we were working on the base uh, specification, but now we got to it. And what we propose is uh, to add in the base uh, packet uh, the two octet uh, field, uh, which is a non zero um, unsigned integer. And uh, the value will be set by session sender and must not change you during the course of what is uh, perceived as stamps test session. And um, session reflector, stamp session reflector that supports uh, this uh, new specification uh, must copy this uh, value and put it into uh, its field. So just to save time, uh, space, uh, we didn't copy their format of their uh, session reflector packet, uh, unauthenticated and authenticated. But you can look in the uh, document, and um, so all uh, formats are presented there. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, HMAC TLV. Um, so, as you know, STEM has two modes, unauthenticated and authenticated. In authenticated mode, uh, we use HMAC to um, do identity protection. And uh, we follow the same approach uh, with extensions by introducing HMAC TOV. And uh, effectively, this is the same um, size. So uh, the proposal is that um notes supporting this specification will use hmac sa uh, uh, 256 and the digest will be truncated to 128 bits the hmac tlv must uh, be used uh, when the stamp is on authenticated mode and uh it may be used uh, if it's uh, unauthenticated. And it protects only uh, TOVs. So uh, when HMAC is uh, present, it protects only TOVs. It doesn't protect uh, the stamp uh, base pack. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So uh, for TOV processing, um, we try to improve um, or clarify how their um, TOVs uh, should be processed. Some TOVs that have a uh, fixed size. So now we specify that uh, the receiver of TOV must check um, the length and um, if uh, the length is not correct, then stop processing and session reflector uh, must uh, send ICMP error message. Uh, it should be throttled. Um, pointing to um, length field that caused the problem. Next slide, please. So um, we understand there are um, quite extensive updates, and we always welcome comments. Uh, we had very good discussion with Rakesh, and appreciate his uh, comments. And uh, authors, we think that uh, the document is ready for working group last call. Looks like um, Rakesh is in the queue. Do you want to speak? Uh -huh. Thanks, Greg, uh, for uh, good discussions. Um, I think um, with adding the session ID in uh, query format there, uh, we are um, now exhausting all the um, available bits. Um, 
where we don't need to copy it from the query to responder. Uh, it just became RFC now, and uh, at this point, we have no more bits left without uh, reflector has to copy it. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, we talked about it, um, and um, if it's possible to have session ID in a TLV, this way we could still have those bits uh, if you want to extend it for some use cases that uh, um, just became RFC now, so. Yeah, uh, if, if we can go back to the uh, slide, um, and thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, one more. Yes, so um, as you see there, uh, the format of session um, sender unauthenticated packet. So uh, we do have uh, 28 octets here uh, if we want to extend their uh, base packet. And uh, if, um, yes, um, in this presentation, I, I didn't uh, include just to save space. Um, session reflected unauthenticated packet, but it does have uh, uh, three octets that are not assigned there uh, must be zero. So yes, I understand their space is uh, scarce, but there there is still space. So yeah, it's there. Um, thanks, Greg. It's there. Uh, it's just that the reflector has to copy it from uh, one place to another place, um, right? Without um, uh, you can just send it back as is. So that's one constraint. Uh, true, but that's um, sort of a how um, stamp operates because the reflector copies uh, the sequence number and timestamp uh, information from the received. Uh, packet uh, already. Uh, if, if we look at the format of the packets, um, so their uh, session reflector packet, again, um, in first includes the information that reflector puts in, and then it uh, carries the information that uh, was received from the session sender. Uh, yeah, I think we are on the same page. I think we understand uh, uh, what is the behavior. And uh, I just wanted to highlight that there is no bit left where it can be it can come back without having to copy from query to responder. Uh, if that's uh, not there, oh, are we okay with that? That's fine. Oh, okay. Um, no, actually, I, I will point that uh, the three octets at, at the end of the packet uh, they are not used um, in session sender and not used in session reflector uh, packet formats. So if we look for uh, the space um, in a packet that is available in both uh, packets in session sender and session reflector unauthenticated packets, then we have three octets that are available in both and they're in the same place. If we can use that, we should clarify that, that there are three bytes which represent that this can be used by querier and responder. Um, and, uh, okay, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it's uh, in RFC, so uh, we, we can take it offline. And uh, again, I understand that now it's, uh, you, you need to imagine from their uh, RFC 8762, but when we discussed where to put a session identifier, we considered to use this space, but then we decided to keep it uh, next to the error estimate. So basically to have fields more uh, contiguous. All right, thank you. Um, I think we also have Martin Duke in the queue. Martin Duke, uh, thanks, Greg. Um, What's the use case for this SSID? Is this if you have NATS in the path or something? Or what, when would you um, Yeah, um, the, one of the uh, extensions that we have is uh, to be able to control DSCP marking. Um, and um, so introducing the session ID just simplifies 
their uh, session identification. So what we, um, clear, uh, our thought was that it can be used uh, in a combination with one of the four tuples, and four tuples being uh, source IP destination and source, source and destination UDP ports. So uh, it's a, probably will simplify uh, the operational uh, procedure and uh, simplify for the um, uh, reflector, especially in um, STEM-based specification, uh, their notion of uh, stateful and stateless uh, STEM session reflector uh, defined. So if it's a stateful, it runs its own sequence number. So to uh, allow uh, measurement of um, one-way packet loss and uh, session identifier uh, will simplify um, their implementation of uh, STEM session reflector stateful. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Greg. Okay. Thank you. Move on. Thank you so much. All right. So next we have a large chunk on IOAM. As a time check, we started a little bit late, so we're running 10, 15 minutes behind. So we'll see how much we need for this topic. And if we need to, we may have to bump a couple of things off the end of the agenda. I can try to speak a little faster, but I'm not sure that's going to help. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so this is a presentation between uh, myself and Tel, who's going to go and pretty clip to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to go cover two drafts, the first ones, so the data draft and the V6 options draft, and Tel's going to go and cover the flex draft and the direct export drafts. Uh, so, uh, Tommy, you already said that we went through, next slide, a working group last call on uh, the IOM data draft, and uh, that resolved in quite a few comments. So, um, thanks to all reviewers uh, for their detailed reviews. Um, so, much appreciated, because I believe that it really made the document much better and much stronger. So, um, in order to go and deal with these comments, in a relatively structured way, we created uh, issues on Git, uh, and we grouped these issues a little bit. And uh, what I'll go do is, uh, in the next maybe five minutes, quickly skim through all the various updates that we've done. Um, obviously, well, we can't really discuss every single text change because there's quite a few, as you already see in, in the list of issues here. But I'll try to go and give you a glimpse of what happened. Um, maybe also to go and um, provide a little bit of an incentive to go back to the document and um, diff it to uh, the 08 version and see whether you're happy with the updates. So let's flip to the next slide and go through the whole thing issue by issue. So um, 147, which also links to 158, uh, 149, and uh, which also links to 157, brought up by how you, uh, Greg and, and Mickey, and they brought up a bunch of editorial glitches uh, that we have resolved. So one thing was uh, there could be, so the document made, made um, reference that, well, if the, the remaining length drops to zero, then you can't insert anything more. But there could be a situation where the remaining length is less than what you can go and drop into, um, and it's still not zero. And so, well, good nuance, good catch. I think that's been clarified. There is a bunch of sloppy language. That's all thanks to uh, Frank writing the, the initial document. Uh, so I said so, certain things like native IPv6 and Greg caught those, like there's no such thing as native IPv6 as v6, right? Um, we had references to drafts that are expired by now, um, like Petter's draft, for instance, we got rid of those uh, in order to clean those up because Petter stopped maintaining that one. And um, there's a couple of statements and Mickey caught those around uh, Price types, and we never ever sta stated explicitly that, well, we expect that the ordering of the data fields is following the order of the bits. Implicitly, that was already there, and all the examples were that way, but we never ever um, stated that explicitly. We do that by now. 
uh, we have statements that transit nodes must not modify fields in the in the fixed header, and uh, also that must be zero fields uh, should be also then uh, set to not only zero but also ignored by by, by transit nodes. So I think all of these things are obvious, but it's it's very helpful to state the obvious. Um, Greg brought up an issue about uh, the term in C2. Um, and IOM evolved from something that was clearly only in C2, i.e. piggybagging uh, information on top of the packet. Um, by now, we have other options where there might be pure IOM packets, like loopback, for instance. And, um, well, for those, in C2 wouldn't apply, but we, we obviously want to go and keep the term. Uh, so we said, well, it's an umbrella term instead of, like, it. Let's well focus on a specific functionality. So I think it's now the the group name instead of well, there is a specific function there. Um, next slide. So let's keep rolling to one fifty one, which is again one from Greg, uh, and that's again I think probably to blame on me. Um, early on, we didn't really properly use twenty one um, nineteen, and uh, there's been statements with upper scale, upper case should that shouldn't have been upper scale, uppercase should, and that's been clarified um, so that um, it should be possible. And obviously you need to understand what would happen if you know, the, the possibility is not met. Um, well, that wasn't really the, 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 the case. I think we wanted to outline that is uh, there is an option to go and go this way, but there is another option. So I think we wanted to go and outline options instead of steering people one particular direction. Um, next slide, 152 is on existing definitions. Again, clarifications, you could call them editorial or classifications. Uh, so what happens if the underlying protocol in the gray? Again, Greg, thanks for all the nitty gritty reviews, really helpful. Um, what if the underlying encapsulation protocol doesn't really carry anything like hop limit or, or, um, or TTL? Well, there is nothing. What would you put in? Well, we put FF in now, so we hadn't really that, that thing specified. Um, we hadn't really specified, although the examples were there, uh, what the field length is for trace type zero, which is four bytes. And um, we got rid of um, implicit definition of nomenclature, like IOM capable nodes. Uh, we never ever wanted to go and define that, that thing, and we are steering clear of that now. Let's flip to the next one and uh, address 153. Uh, which is uh, from Greg and Barack. Um, there is a couple of fields, and we did that on purpose, as we all remember, that don't really carry a unit type. And um, that discussion was, well, intensely discussed in the design team as well, of what to go do with this. Should we have uh, finally a conclusion that we want a unit type for these fields? Um, given that it limits flexibility and it also creates a problem with certain implementations because not everybody would go and use the same unit necessarily. Um, so what we were reverting back to is a suggestion without really a forcing function where we say, well, it's really beneficial if people moving forward would use bytes as a unit, uh, but we're not forcing this for now because we know that implementations differ for now. Um, let's move on to 153, uh, 154. Um, one from Greg and Barack again. Um, there has been suggestions for additional data fields, and in the working group, we've seen many additional suggestions prior. And we felt that given that we're very, very close to the finish line, it's much better to finish this document off and then have additional documents that can make the case for additional data fields along with the use cases and explain that as opposed to we're opening up lengthy discussions because we know that these discussions will be lengthy as we've seen them in the past. Uh, so we decided not to do anything about additions, functional additions to the document. Uh, so we are revising the document, we're making it crisper, we're not adding functionality at this stage anymore. Um, then there's been uh, security related questions and uh, Greg and I think Tal addressed most of those in, in section eight. Um, around a bunch of additional security aspects. So I think the, the security section probably doubled by now in size uh, from 08 to 09. Um, so thanks, Tel, for all the additions. It's kind of what happens with uh, nodes that maliciously change IOM data. Uh, it discusses the leaking 
uh, debate that we had, like especially with the six man people in in uh, detail. And uh, there's been kind of also a forward reference to if you are having specific questions about encapsulation related um, questions with IOEM, those need to be covered in the related encapsulation drafts because we can't really cover them in the data draft. Um, let's jump forward to uh, cover 156. Uh, that's been one from Mickey who brought that up and also provided the patch. Thanks, Mickey. Um, so there was a question like, yeah, well, no timestamps, um, a, uh, a packet on ANCAP, but um, what, time, what, what is this timestamp representing? And there's multiple options what this timestamp could represent. And again, given that we didn't really want to go and constrain implementations, we said, well, what we really want to know is when the thing is going to go timestamp the packet, not that everybody timestamps the packet necessarily the same way. Um, so the option that we've opted for finally, or that we went for is to require that the uh, implementation documents um, how it's gonna go and when it's gonna go timestamp the packet, uh, acknowledging that there is multiple options. So I think a documentation request is there instead of mandating everybody behaving the same way, which is hard because there is too much variety out there in the chipsets and what we can go to. Uh, let's flip to the next slide. Uh, 158 is again from Mickey. Um, almost an well, it's an editorial glitch. We, in 7.4 and section 7.4, we forgot that, well, there is bits available for assignment. And um, that is something that we will address by now was missing and then another editorial glitch that Mickey caught was there was references to direct export still in the draft. Uh, direct export has its own draft by now. Uh, so we moved everything out and uh, also the few traces and remainders that were in there uh, got caught by Mickey and been uh, ironed out. And I think that brings me to the, the end of this lengthy list um, and um, considering next steps for that particular document. So we had a lot of a load of really good comments. I think we done, did a load of edits. Um, since then, well, after the working group last call finished, the whole thing went quiet. It could be an indication of there is no more comments. It could be an indication people were waiting for the for the 09 version to go and reread it. Uh, so my reading was on that, and we we discussed that in the design team earlier on today, or well, last night for the people in the US. Um, was um, that well, we want to go and give everybody obviously a, a, a period of time to go and re-review. And um, if there is nothing major received, we might want to go and consider another working group last call by something that may. Um, Tommy, do you want to go and take questions now or should we go through the entire blob and then take everything in one go? Maybe I think we want to go and take questions now. Feedback on the changes that were made in the draft 09 update during working group last call, specifically the people who um, provided reviews. Um, I see, of course, Greg did a lot of those uh, as well as Mickey. If, if you want to speak up at all now um, with your thoughts of if you think that's addressed and what you think is required going forward to make sure we have good enough review before we send this on, that'd be great. But otherwise, we can move on. So, yeah, Greg. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, thanks. Um, yes, as Frank mentioned, <laughs> we had a um, discussion, uh, review the uh, presentation uh, last night, and uh, I agree with the proposed uh, timeline. So uh, I need some time to review the updates because one of the reasons it's quite significant changes. So uh, targeting um, Working group last call on the data document somewhere in May uh, sounds reasonable. Before that, I'll, I'll review it and I'll, I'll share my um, conclusions uh, with the list uh, after I review the latest version. Thank you. That's thanks, Rick. Ms. Mickey, um, I believe all my comments were addressed, and I agree with the proposals for moving forward. Noted. Thank you.
like we don't have anyone else in the queue. So if we want to continue on the slides, that'd be great. Then let's flip to the next slide. Um, so this one is on V6 options. And um, the changes were dramatic. Um, I needed to go and change Mickey's email address. And uh, well, not me, Schwetter did that and posted the update. And um, in addition, I have to go and thanks, uh, uh, send thanks to uh, Tommy for kicking off the, the process for early allocation uh, for two option types. So we're hoping to go and uh, get those allocated so that um, I've seen Justin or his V6 implementation in the Linux kernel on the, on the call earlier, so that we, we get those things um, into code as well. And that we, well, maybe at some point even end up with interoperable implementations and no divergence at that level. So I think that's good news. So thanks, Tommy, for kicking this off. And um, well, the, the updates were minor. So the, the real question is how do you, what we want to go and do from a document progression perspective, if you go to the next slide. Um, and um, we discussed this in the design team earlier on. I think uh, there was more of a, a feeling that we want to go and sequence working group last calls rather than going in data in, in parallel. Um, but maybe I think this is something that we want to go and address um, once we're done with the data draft. That makes good sense to me. Yeah. Because I think That's we also need to go and have the, the co-review by, by six man. So it's going to be a lengthy exercise in any, in any case. Yeah. That's correct. Um, and as we saw earlier, we have other documents that look like they're getting ready for last call. So um, those may interleave. You see how you and the uh, queue? Yeah. yeah, I saw some comments on actually uh, a month ago, we just uh, submit another draft, uh, which actually summarized several options to apply the IOM in IPv6 uh, environments. Um, uh, it, the current, uh, uh, we, because we identify some uh, uh, practical issues for the current proposal, then, um, but there might some be alternative ways to avoid that. So, in basically in that in that draft, we um, gave several uh, possible options, and we should suggest everybody uh, uh, to read that uh, draft and provide your comments and. Uh, uh, I think the the, the best uh, one uh, should be um, maybe um, picked from that list of options. So uh, that's our suggestion. Thank you. Um... Do we have anything more for this one, or should we move on to? I think we can move on. Yeah. I mean, if there's nobody else in the queue, then um, I think you can go and hand the uh, yeah. ball or whatever we want to go and call it here to tell. I was going to go cover the, the next two. Tell, are you here? Thank you. Um, and, and let's try to cover these next two within uh, 10 minutes or less. If we can. Okay, sure. We can do that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we had a few meetings in the uh, design team about the flags draft, and um, we re uh, revised the draft. And the current version has a few changes compared to the previous version based on feedback we received from people on the working group and based on feedback from the last ITF meeting. One thing that was discussed a couple of times in the IETF meeting and also in the virtual meetings um, was security aspects and specifically amplification attacks. And we added more text to emphasize these attacks to discuss when they are uh, relevant and also to suggest measures that can be taken to mitigate these attacks. One is to use rate limiting the other is data minimization, which means you limit the number of data fields that are used uh, when you use the loopback flag. Um, and that's, that's basically uh, one measure that can significantly reduce the uh, scope and the scale of an amplification attack. So hopefully uh, we'll get some feedback about that um, 
We want to make sure that the changes we made address the concerns that were raised specifically about amplification attacks. Next, please. One open issue that we still want to uh, hear some more feedback from the working group about is the uh, loopback reverse path. The thing is that uh, one of the points that were raised, and this is a good point, is that we do not want, uh, when a packet is looped back, using the loopback flag, we do not want uh, IOM data to be incorporated into that packet when it's on the reverse path. So in order to uh, avoid having IOM transit nodes push uh, data fields into that uh, packet that has the uh, loopback on the reverse path, we need some way of indicating to these nodes that the packet is on the reverse path. So there are a few uh, ways, a few possible ways to do that. One way is by using a new flag, and we're not very eager to do that, to define a new flag. Another way to go is to define a new IOM type, uh, which would not consume another flag, so uh, maybe more preferable. And finally, the third option is kind of a hack, but it may still work, which is basically the node that loops back the packet and clear the remaining length field. And uh, that way, again, transit nodes on the way back will not add any data fields. So this is an open issue. And again, we're looking for feedback from people just to get a feeling of how people think this should be addressed. This is the final slide about the flag draft. So th this was an open issue and uh, hopefully once we resolve this open issue, it will be um, ready for working group last call. But at this point, we want to still hear some more feedback about this. Frank, I think you're first in the queue. Yeah, it was just, well, it was, was mostly putting the question directly to Brian uh, Trammell. Uh, because, uh, I think you were pretty vocal about the packet amplification problem loopback could go and create. Um, so do you have any thoughts or a preference for the approaches that uh, Tal was mentioning or any guidance for us? So um, I, I quickly had a look at this for um, uh, the meeting as well. And um, this downgrades it from a, I can see how this is an amplification attack to this smells like an amplification attack, right? So that's good, right? Like, so it's gone from, from um, uh, ooh, scary to I have a, an uneasy feeling about this. Uh, I'd have to dig into it um, a bit more. Like, I'd, I'd have to see a more detailed design to actually be able to, um, uh, to analyze it. The, the, there's two things that you're that you're looking to prevent here, um, and the like. So clearing a remaining lens field or adding a new flag um, basically solves one of those cases where you have um, all of the devices on the path are trustworthy with respect to this feature. Um, it's I, I'd have to think a little bit more about the the um, uh, the threat model here. Um, and I can try and spend some time on that, not right in the middle of a meeting. Um, but if the threat model includes that there might be devices that can actually touch those flags um, and not be um, well-intentioned about it, um, then you still have to be careful with this. So this is definitely better um, in that I can't, you know, I can't like point at it and go, ooh, reflection. Um, but I can't point at it and go, ooh, no reflection yet. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah, it helps. And if you spend more cycles on it, it helps even more. Uh, yeah, I will try and find cycles, but I'm working 50% these days. So, um, I don't know where those cycles are going to come from, or I know where they're going to come from. I just don't know when. Oh, 
All right, that sounds like good next steps. And of course, if anyone else wants to um, um, do threat analysis here, let's do that. <laughs> Martin Duke, you're next in the queue. Yeah, so I, I also intend to take a look at this. I think from an AV perspective, this is likely to be the biggest issue contention in ISG review. Um, I, the only thing I'll suggest at this point without, I mean, I need the same analysis as Brian, but like a rule of thumb that's being used elsewhere in TCVWG is uh, the multiplier of three is about right. That is, the if the attacker has to send X bytes, then you should should not be able to force the rest of the network to generate no more than than three x bytes. Um, I mean, they're using that quick in some other places. So, uh, I mean, that might be one way to look at this problem and, and seeing how we're minimizing it. And you know, limiting it to one option maybe solves that problem. But uh, that would be one sort of rule of thumb that we can apply to to sort of evaluate this. Thank you. Uh, Paul, can we talk about direct export a bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've been trying to take notes during the <laughs> actual uh, Thank you for doing that. Okay, so um, direct exporting, uh, basically this draft uh, has been around for a few months and the idea is that rather than incorporating data fields into uh, data packets, what we do is export the uh, information, the data fields, uh, to an external entity. Next, please. So the draft was adopted by the working group in December, and in February uh, we submitted the um, working group document version of this draft, and there were pretty minor changes like terminology changes and a few um, references that weren't relevant were removed. Next, please. The main major issue that we still need to tackle here is uh, something that we discussed a few times, but we haven't reached a conclusion yet, which is the question whether the X option should include a specific hop count field or not. And if it doesn't include the hop count field, that uh, would mean that we would be able to use the hop limit node ID data field, which is, which is already defined in the data draft. And there are basically pros and cons for each of these approaches. Um, and we can see these pros and cons here. Just very briefly, if there is no hop count, uh, that means we uh, use the existing functionality, so we don't need to define something new. And also it means that transit nodes do not need to update the DEX option. They just forward the packet without uh, modifying the option. Um, if we look at the explicit, explicit hop count, um, one advantage is that uh, basically when, when you use the hop limit data field, you rely on copying the TTL or hop count from a lower layer. So if there's this, an explicit hop count field, you don't rely on a lower layer, which in some cases uh, doesn't necessarily include a TTL field. Also, another advantage is that uh, it, in some cases, it may, may be more accurate than using the uh, TTL that is copied from the lower layer. Uh, in some cases, you may have some IOM-capable nodes that have been skipped for one reason or another, and you want to be able to detect that, and you can use that uh, to detect these cases. So these are basically the pros and cons. Um, we are looking for some more feedback from people in order for us to be able to resolve this and to decide which way to go. Um, I think Greg is up first for a question. Oh, did you want to take questions now or at the very end? I think this is the last slide, so let's take questions yeah, now. Yeah, this would be a good time for questions. Um, hi, uh, Tal, uh, thanks for the updates and the presentation and uh, um, stating their open questions. Um, I just want to mention um, 
of uh, another draft. Um, it's a hybrid two-step, and I think that uh, there might be some uh, interesting, um, well, I don't like this word, but synergy uh, between their approach of uh, direct export and hybrid two-step. Uh, I think that both are complementary, and uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to just uh, mention and um, propose that uh, we're working uh, on this and discuss it on the list, of course, and in the design team. Thanks. Um, Martin, you're next. Yes, I, I don't understand how loopback is not a special case of direct export where the export target happens to be the originator. And um, if that is correct, it would be great if we could converge on a single solution for this rather than have two separate approaches go to last call. Well, uh, I think basically we, we have heard this comment in the past, um, and I think uh, the intention for these two flavors was a bit different. Uh, Lubeck was intended to be uh, returned to the origin, to the encapsulating node, in order to allow something like a uh, trace route. And uh, on the other hand, DEX is, is intended to be collected by a collector or a central entity. Um, so the intention was a bit different. And what one big advantage is that, or one big difference between these two approaches is that in the DEX case, we do not want transit nodes to modify the packet. And in the loopback case, we do want transit nodes to modify the packet because we do want to incorporate that information when it goes back to the encapsulating node. Okay. Uh, Martin, did you have anything else you want to follow up or should we move on to Brian? Let's move on. Go for it, Brian. So I'm actually going to follow up on uh, on Martin's comment. Um, uh, Thanks, Tal, for reiterating sort of the difference between these two things. I would I would phrase it a little bit more simply. In the direct export case, the um, target, like the place that the that the export is going to go, is actually a matter of configuration. So it's the control plane for each device. Whereas in the loopback case, the information about where it should go is taken out of the the um, the IP packet. Right, it's the source address, the IP packet. That's a that is a an accurate statement, correct? Yep. Okay. So, um, I think that makes this a little bit less scary um, uh, in terms of sort of like amplification type things in that, you know, you actually can be which device you're going to throw all of the traffic at as a matter of configuration. Um, it would be nice. Let me actually, I have it up in front of me. Um, yeah, okay, the security considerations of this document now, I, I, I think are good for handling that. And um, I like the fact that these two documents now have um, uh, parallel security considerations. I'm gonna put up a, a, a thing on my list of things to do, which again, low bandwidth these days, um, to follow up on this on the list. Um, but I do like the fact that these are at least converging a bit in, in um, uh, warnings about how they can be misused. I think this discussion leads me to think that there's room for, even if they are separate options, long-term they should be defined kind of in a common place and essentially as variations on each other with lots of shared considerations. I would say not speaking from the chair, um, I uh, very much um, agree with that statement. Um, in the interest of time, I think we are going to move on. Um, so, of not working group. Did you need to get back in the queue for something important or? Oh, sorry, you had removed. I think Martin's muted. So yeah, we're, right. let's, yeah, let's move on for now. Um, all right, so we have a couple of other 
documents we want to cover. We don't have a ton of time left. So if we can keep each of these to just around five minutes and just get through the first three, if we can, that'll be great. Rudiger, are you here? Okay. Uh, yep. The basic idea behind that was uh, I've been working with segment routing and uh, performance monitoring for a while. And the design aim of this draft IPPM connectivity monitoring was to use segment routing to have something like um, ping functionality, which means uh, you scale with ping one signal per interface to be monitored, but you take out a little more information. And I'm especially interested in uh, locating congestion. So uh, it took me a while to figure out how you could do something what should be called network tomography and um, set up paths which you control in the setup. Nothing is um, uh, accidental here. Uh, and use not more than one measurement relation per monitored interface and have all the information like connectivity, uh, locating um, congestion, and also being able to measure a round trip time per interface or path, and uh, do all that uh, in a controlled way. Right, this is uh, the motivation. And then uh, if you flip to the next slide, I, uh, slide, I, uh, yeah, that's a bit difficult stuff. Uh, with segment routing, you can fix paths through a network. So here you see two things. Uh, one is what a single measurement path is looking like and the second is how you'd overlay several measurement paths. And in the end, you can measure all the metrics uh, or parameters, which I mentioned on the first slide. So the above one shows that uh, you start to measure from the path monitoring system. You pass the first router. Then you make a kind of a U-turn. And then you do two other links one you do downstream and the other upstream and then back to the measurement system. That is a single measurement path. In the end, and that's described in the draft, you create an overlay which will create the pattern shown below with the three colors. Uh, and it has the properties shown per monitored path or interface. That is, you have one U-turn you have one measurement going upstream through the interface and one measurement going down, downstream. And now um, you see that between LSRA and the LERI. Uh, the question might be now what is missing on LERI if you have a, another measurement path yellow uh, that may, would make a U-turn there. And if you then overlay all the measurement paths, and evaluate them simultaneously, and that's the network tomography part. Then you can figure out that um, if you l have a packet loss on all three paths, shown here green, red, and blue simultaneously, you lost connectivity between LSRA and LRI. There's no other explanation for that. If you have a growing delay, on red and blue, that can only be caused by congestion on the interface LSRA to LERI. And if you have um, simultaneous added delay on green and blue, that can only be LERI to LSRA. Uh, the expectation here is that uh, there is a single event in the network only. The design is uh, done for that and well, I'm working with a carrier, so that's what usually happens. There's a single cause of error. There's no catastrophe. And that is what this draft is about, uh, creating a metric which allows you to set up measurement paths in a controlled way as shown here. And um, well, if you do that on a larger scale, you likely have to automize it. The automation is not uh, part of uh, this draft. It's only the metric that's 
special setup of paths and uh, the math you have to do to seize all the information. And that is it. If you like that, please comment on the list. Uh, I'd be interested, of course, of make, uh, uh, making this uh, a workgroup document. I'm not sure whether we are chartered for segment routing. Oh, we are, we should be. Um, all right, thank you so much. Uh, again, to everyone, please do comment on the list. What do you think about this? I think we have time for one quick comment from Greg. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, and uh, the question, I have is how well synchronized are uh, these uh, reports um, on different spans uh, measurement paths you need to have? Because the correlating uh, events, if they're persistent state, yes, that's probably easier, but they, uh, if it's intermittent, that um, you need to have certain uh, window of uh, event synchronization. Sure, sure, that's true. I mean, um, that's a Nyquist, I think. Um, if you want to detect uh, something in a time frame of like 10 seconds, I say, or 10 milliseconds, you should uh, have a packet distance of 5 milliseconds per measurement relation, and then you will be able to detect it for sure. Okay, thank you. With this, welcome. Okay. All right. There's no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, how are you? Do you want to? Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think you do have a number of slides, so if you want to. Yeah, I have a, I have a quick. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So uh, this uh, postcard based uh, telemetry uh, draft we have been submitted uh, uh, almost two years ago. Uh, but uh, um, this is the first time we got a chance to present in this working group. and. Uh, uh, but it has been through a lot of discussions in the email list and also it have some influence and impact on some ongoing works. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, what's new in, uh, this, I, I believe this is already uh, version 05 and uh, in this new version, uh, we changed the status of the draft to informational. Uh, the main reason uh, for that is that we, uh, we think uh, we, we will move all the normative uh, specifications to some other directly related drafts. Um, but for, for, um, in, in this uh, draft, we just uh, position the two uh, possible solutions of a PBT. We name that PBTM and the PBTI, just as two high level approaches of PBT. So, uh, in, uh, uh, for example, the, the PBTI, I stands for instruction, um, will become an independent IOM option, uh, direct export. And another one, we have uh, another draft to show how it will be implemented in some other uh, protocols such as SRV6. Next slide, please. So on the high level in this draft, we, uh, we consider both uh, uh, this Type uh, a group of uh, techniques uh, covered by this uh, on pass flow telemetry techniques, and uh, there are two uh, basic modes for that. One first one is we call it the passport mode. So the IOM trace mode is uh, one uh, representations of, of for that mode, and another um, main branch is a postcard mode, and this postcard mode can be further partitioned to two subtypes. The first one is instruction based. We call that PBTI. Uh, the representative uh, technique is uh, IOM, a direct export option. And another one we call that uh, uh, PBTM, uh, M is marking based uh, PBT subtype. So for this type of another draft, uh, we call that SRV6 PBT, uh, is one representation for that. And also, we there's another draft called, uh, to support multicast telemetry, uh, which basically can use uh, the combination uh, of the postcard mode and the instruction based uh, um, uh, uh, passport mode and the instruction based PBT mode. So we can consider that is a is uh, a hybrid mode. Next next slide, please. So we'll go through the next three slides quickly. 
Uh, basically, uh, in this draft, we also summarize uh, the pros and cons of uh, each mode. Uh, for example, for this passport-based uh, telemetry, uh, uh, it, it's, it's good for uh, you know data self-describing and it uh, has lower uh, export overhead and it's easy to configure. Um, but it has some other issues like, uh, it's, uh, you know, since the header need to carry both the instruction and the data, it has some impact on performance and also uh, inflates the packed header, uh, packed size and uh, cause some issues on the encapsulation uh, in some protocols. And also there are some security concerns uh, if you carry this uh, sensitive uh, environment data along with the package. And also, if the data dropped on the following path, you will lose uh, lose everything. Uh, so there's some drawbacks. And next slide. Um, uh, for the postcard uh, uh, marking based, you know, you don't need to uh, encapsulate in any new header in the package. So it basically uh, the user package remain the same, and you send the data uh, using independent uh, um, postcard package. To report uh, to uh, collected data, so it has a uh, um, basically it's a uh, uh, address several uh, issues of the um, passport mode, but it has some introduced some new issues like the data co correlation, and uh, uh, it increased ex data export overhead, and it also um, needs to configure all the nodes in the network, so the configuration overhead is also high. Next slide. And the postcard based, uh, uh, this, so this uh, mark um, instruction based uh, uh, postcard mode kind of like is a, uh, you know, it's it mix of the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, provide some trade offs and uh, makes uh, uh, address some of the issues and, uh, um, but, uh, but it also has some, uh, some drawbacks remains like the uh, export overhead is still uh, kind of high. It also reintroduced the encapsulation issues, but on, on the other hand, it's uh, it, it's also uh, good on the other uh, aspects. So why we have this document? And uh, in this document, we describe the high level approaches and makes a good classification on this high level on um, past temperature technique. And we summarize the pros and the cons of uh, each approach. And uh, we also detail the marking-based BBT mode, uh, which is not covered anywhere else. So uh, we can see so far this work has motivated several uh, other uh, works. And uh, but the detailed implementation or standardization of each approach will be covered by separate documents. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, based on uh, the current maturity of this draft, uh, we uh, request the, the uh, working group adoption for it. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and I do want to thank you for all the work that you've done with the design team to incorporate your ideas into the direct export. Um, regarding this document, um, I think my impression and the impression of speaking for all the chairs is um, we're, you know, we want to really converge on documents, not have too many different approaches. And we're happy with how we see a convergence going towards direct export for that. Um, yes. I don't personally see a great need to have an independent informational document that describes some of the background. We do have this, I mean, you always will have a draft here as a reference for that. Publishing this as an informational RFC, that is separate from direct export or anything else, I'm not convinced of the value of. I would love to see if there are bits of explanation for rationale that we want to add into direct export as background sections, appendices. I think that does make sense. Of course, if we have the marking mode, um, having that be a separate document also makes sense. Um, but I guess what I would like to hear is if anyone in the group um, besides the authors feel very strongly that this should be an independent document that the group should adopt, um, please um, chime in now or send something to the list on that. So uh, in, in this slide, uh, uh, 
uh, list several the, the rationale for uh, why we have this doc, uh, document. And especially for the third point, actually, in this document, it describes a marking based PPT. Uh, it's actually not, it's not covered anywhere else. So, and we consider that uh, that's an important approach. Yes. Um, and so I think having a um, you know, specific document that is non informational that talks about how you do the marking as something more of a protocol level thing makes sense. Um, I'm seeing several plus ones um, on the Jabber as well as on the chat in WebEx. So I think for now, what I'm going to ask the authors of this is to work on incorporating any informational um, bits that you have into the direct export effort. Uh, but I think we are not going to um, plan on adopting this currently. And um, yeah, so please let's try to fold things together. So, uh, I also, this yeah. Yeah, I'm also wondering if there's uh, actually a need to actually um, summarize the high level approaches. Uh, is that valuable or, you know, sometimes we do need to understand the pros and cons of each approach. Large architecture. There's, yeah. there's nowhere to find it. Yeah. I, I think in this case, um, we can add that high level description into the direct export document. Um, all right, but thank you for that. Um, I think we are all out of time at this point. Um, just as a reminder, if you did not sign the blue sheet, please go into the etherpad that is linked on the slides. Um, thank you all for doing this and um, having this virtual experience. Sorry if you had any technical glitches and we hope to see you virtually or in person uh, next time and on the lists. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.